So hello, everybody. How was lunch today? I haven't had mine yet. My name is Robert Douglas. I'm with the company Platform.sh. That's actually a product that's built by the Commerce Guys. And I want to talk to you today about a, an aspirational philosophy that I'm developing for deploying web applications. And it's called OCD deployment. Because if you spend a lot of time in your life building something big and important, when you actually want to launch that something, be it you know a website or something more tangible, it's fairly important that you know what the outcome of that's going to be before you um, put yourself in the launch position. So when I speak of a web application, I mean uh, three things. I mean, first of all, code. and. We're very familiar with code being at a Drupal conference, probably some coders in the room. We know that you have to deploy your code to deploy your web application, but actually code doesn't do anything on its own. It also needs infrastructure, and the infrastructure that is used to run not only Drupal but web applications in general has become more and more complex over the years as we've added specialized caching servers and services, specialized search servers, data analysis servers, analytics stuff. Um, maybe you've got streaming servers, transcoding servers. Depending on the nature of your application, there can be quite a lot of infrastructure. Also, you know, given the global nature of many websites with distributed caches around the world. Um, yeah. And, of course, there's data. If your application doesn't have data in the form of a database, uh, uploaded files that you know represent images or documents that have been uploaded to the application, or uh, the you know the derivative data is like the solar index or the search indexes that are generated to you know work with that data. If you don't have that data um, and you don't have the infrastructure, then your code is useless. So when I speak about a web application, I'm actually talking about the trifecta of code infrastructure and, and, and data. And if you don't have all three of those in one specific state that is known to work, then you actually have an unholy mess of, uh, of, of a broken application. You have uh, the, the movie before. Um, so deployment also means the moving of those things, code, data, and infrastructure between your local environment, dev, stage, prod, and we're all familiar with these concepts of, you know, moving the application through some stages to get it on its way towards uh, deployment. But in reality, it's not dev, stage, prod. It's more like this, right? Um, and depending on how many developers you have, that becomes exponentially more complicated. So given all the variables and factors that are involved with, you know, making sure that your code, data, and infrastructure are in the right place, I want to make sure and help you not become threatened at the existential level when you do your deployment. So what does OCD stand for? It stands for orchestrated, consistent, and deterministic. And remember, this is an aspirational idea for how your deployments should go in an ideal world. And I'm going to use examples from my product, platform.sh, but I'm not going to claim that we solve all of the problems that I put forward. This is more of a framework for you to use when you think about deployment and think about your build versus buy decisions, whether you're going to do Ansible, Docker, local, or you're going to look for a company that helps you with that. And when you evaluate, evaluate what that company actually offers, do they get you to OCD deployment? So orchestrated means, in the dictionary, planned to produce a desired effect. Um, in the world of web applications, orchestrated means provisioning servers, provisioning storage and network, launching and configura configuring services on those servers, deploying code and data, and monitoring maintenance change management along the way after you've got everything set up. And doing that across many environments, as we saw before, because you just don't have a production environment, you have dev, staging, prod, and all the permutations thereof. Orchestrated also means, in the case of Drupal, uh, if you want high availability websites, which are a must these days for any business critical application, then you need things like HAProxy, Nginx, FPM, PHP, FPM, MariaDB, Postgres in a, in a con uh, cluster configuration, uh, Elasticsearch with triple redundant nodes, Redis, Memcache for caching. And as you see from the alphabet soup and the number of services there, even before you get into esoteric stuff like MongoDB or an OJS or 
uh, heaven forbid you're trying something really cool like PostgreSQL, then orchestrating this really becomes a big challenge. So here's the first example for platform.sh. On your road to orchestrated and consistent uh, and deterministic deployment, Platform SH gives you as a developer the ability to specify the services that you need running in your application in a very easy to read YAML file, which is familiar to anybody who's working on Drupal 8 to begin with. And you say you want MySQL, you say you want Redis, you say you want uh, Elasticsearch or MongoDB or Postgres, and you say how much storage that needs, and then you push that to get, and voila, you have all of the orchestration with all of those concerns, storage, network I.O., backups, recovery, everything taken care of, and you have that at a per environment level. So for your Git branch, and only your Git branch at that moment, you've got MongoDB and nobody else does. But when you merge that into another branch, then that branch will also have MongoDB. So that's the orchestrated part. Orchestrated also means setting up things like mount points or cron or backup schedules. Guess what? Those are just YAML files as well. So moving the orchestration, the control of orchestration to the uh, version control level, so something that you can store into Git and something that your developers, without being sysadmins, can actually influence with just a couple of lines of code is the aspirational goal that Platform.sh provides in terms of orchestrated, deterministic, and consistent deployment. You have a wide menu of services that you can choose from, uh, wider than any other offer that you can uh, find at this conference at least. And we deploy onto a number of clouds. Uh, our home base is a AWS, but if you have clients who have uh, a lot of Azure credits to burn through, then we can deploy there as well. So consistent acting or done in the same way over time. So this is how you deploy, okay? When you, w when you want to deploy to your local development environment or your staging or um, testing environment, how do you do it? Well, the world is showing us as it consolidates um, through many technologies and many different industries that the most consistent way to deploy anything these days is through Git push. If you try OpenShift, you Git push. Uh, if you try platform.sh, it's the same thing. Deployment is simply Git pushing whatever you've done in your repository to whatever environment you're deploying to, and that will do the OCD deployment on that environment. And the nice thing about having that consistency is that you have portability uh, across your developers. There's no uh, deployment workflow. You don't have one pe person who's used Puppet, another person who's used Ansible, another person who knows Chef inside and out. You just have developers who are using a tool native not only to their own day-to-day -day existence, but to the uh, development workflow you've set up as a team, Git push. And finally, uh, consistent means um, that you use the same tools to deploy on every environment, that you know f deploying from one environment to the next is not only done the same way, but it has the same result. And it's not just the code that you're moving around, but you're always testing everything, uh, every step along the way, with actual infrastructure and actual data. So one thing that's really hard to do in this respect, if you're doing, you know, uh, if you're trying to build something like this for your team, is the data management. Docker's kind of made it easy for us to spin up services that work really well, but what Docker hasn't really solved is getting that 100 terabytes of uh, images from your live server and the 10 gigabyte uh, um, database and the solar index that you've got all ready to go from the production environment down onto your staging or down onto your local. And the example to give from platform.sh there is that we have a, a really cool file system level technology that will guarantee that you've got your new environment to test on or to develop on in one to two minutes, even if you're dealing with 100 gigabytes of data, it doesn't really matter. It goes really fast, and it's its own copy of it. So you can start working on that environment um, as if it's its own thing uh, in just a couple of minutes. It makes the cost of integrating the branching and merging Git workflow to your entire infrastructure and your entire application really cheap. It means your developers will make lots of branches and test things out on a feature level and demo, demo things to your customers at a feature level rather than having to pack them all together on some staging server and you know hope that one person's feature didn't break another person's feature. Um, and that's just, um, it, it, there's no dramatic <laughs> demonstration of what I said, so I just put a screenshot of platform.sh there. 
Um, let's move on to deterministic, though. What does the D in OCD deployment stand for? It means deterministic. It means for every event there exists conditions that could only that could cause no other event. It means when you deploy in an OCD deployment, you know that it's going to work the same way every time. There's only one outcome. Now, what does that mean exactly? So we have a concept that for every git hash, there's only one application can be launched. That means it's not, it's impervious to changes in uh, Drupal module updates. It's impervious to whether your composer JSON resolves different dependencies. If you're pulling in stuff with NPM, PIP, or Ruby gems that you need for Compass, SAS, LESS, Bower, Grunt, whatever, Platform has all those things, but once you build your application one time successfully, then it actually stores that on a read-only file system, and that's what will be deployed every time you move it through different staging, development, and finally production environments. That means that if you successfully build your application and test it on one environment, when you move it into a new environment, it's not checking out new code, it's not calling Drush make uh, and, and getting new stuff from Drupal.org, you're going to have no surprise views up grade um, that you hadn't counted on, you're going to get a byte-wise copy of the proven, tested file system containing your code so you know your application works exactly how it should. Um, and like I said, platform SH example there is that these days applications um, are oftentimes built beyond just the code that you've written yourself. You might be using Drush Make somehow to get stuff from Drupal.org, but in Drupal 8 and in other uh, PHP applications, you're also running Composer JSON or Composer Lock files to get Composer dependencies. And you know, with Compass and Last and Sess, Less and SAS, then you already are familiar with either Node or Ruby dependencies that you need to pull in uh, and actions that you have to take to prepare what, equi what equates to code, like um, CSS derivatives. Uh, that's actually code, but you're preparing it with these dependencies. Those dependency versions can change. The output um, of the compiling process can change. With Platform, you have absolute bitwise uh, deterministic deployment, making sure that if you've tested your code on one environment, it's going to be consistent across all of them. And that's kind of obvious that you use, uh, well, what's obvious is that you use the same services and code um, for every environment, so it's really important that your PHP version is the same, your Nginx version is the same, my SQL version is the same, that the same code. But what's less obvious in a deterministic way is that if your um, production, if you, if you have a, a deployment into production that you're aiming for, you need to be able to repeat this, pro this deployment many times to test it to make sure it's going to work. And if you actually get to production day and it goes wrong in any way, you want it to be reversible as well. So a deterministic deployment paradigm will actually let you reverse a deployment, not just by checking out a new version of the application, but actually resetting things to how they were across the board, across infrastructure, data, and code. Um, so OCD deployment is not a MySQL dump and a MySQL import because that takes way too long. Gigabytes of data in your database will take hours to import and export. It's not R-syncing for your uploaded files and it's not re-indexing solar. If you have any of those steps built into your deployment or, or when you're setting up your development environments, then you've got the risk for inconsistent data uh, in your testing and you're going to have inconsistent results when you deploy. Um, so here's my last example. It's a video. It's um, just setting up a new project on platform.sh. Uh, when you get going, you've got the choice between Drupal, Symfony, WordPress, but you can actually run any PHP application on Platform SH right now. Um, I'm going to go back and uh, choose Drupal because um, that's where our Drupal gone after all. Let's uh, show Drupal 8. That's the nice next thing. Um, you can just click it there. And what that'll do is it'll check out a Git repository from GitHub that we've got as an example starting point. You can provide your own, whether on GitHub or you just push it up yourself. And um, now you're about to see the world's fastest D8 installation. It's amazing how fast it goes. It's like you can install D8 faster than any other application. Boom, there it is. There's a D8 site. Now we're going to do an entire development workflow where we're going to theme that site. So we're going to start by creating some branches uh, for an agile workflow. We're going to use the button up there to create a branch off the master. Master is the live site, but you're going to want a staging site to test that on. Um, this is just your workflow that you're 
to siding on. It doesn't have to be called staging. It can be called anything you want. It's a Git branch, but it's also an entire copy of the application with infrastructure, with data, with code. And I'm going to repeat for some more branches. I'm going to make a sprint. I'm going to make some feature branches. And as you can see, you literally get a copy of your application for every single branch that you have in your Git repository for every developer that you're working with. That gives you a lot of flexibility on the type of workflow you pick. And then I'm going to go into one of those. And um, one of them is theme fix. So I'm going to go check that out. Um, I'm going to show you in the video, uh, I forgot about this, the fine-grained access level permissions. So you can easily work with outsourced companies or freelance developers or different teams by giving them uh, access level permissions at different, la uh, different points in your workflow. Um, they can go off and do their own agile process, but you've still got a gate check like a pull request if they're going to bring their code back into your mainstream. And that platform enables them to have all the advantages, but you still have to approve their code. Then I'm going to use the platform CLI tool. That's the Symphony console app to get my project for local development. I can choose from all of the branches that I've got up there. I choose the theme fix one, grabs my code. It does the build process, process on it. If there are composer JSON dependencies, it'll resolve them. There are other dependencies from like Drush make files that will get those. And I'm going to go in, I'm, gonna, I'm building this project with a Drush make file so that I can keep the code that I use from Drupal.org separate from the code that I'm actually maintaining in my theme and my modules. I'm just going to add a nice, beautiful, well-designed theme from the Drupal 8 repository. And I'm going to push that up to platform. Just git add, git commit, git push. That's the consistent uh, deployment methodology. And this is an actual deployment of my application onto my theme fix branch. Um, the whole team can see what I'm doing in real time. And then I'm going to be able to go in and test that version of the application with my new git push on this branch for that commit and see the happy results of, um, of that wonderful theme that I made. So come on video, catch up to me. There it is. There's the URL for that branch. Go um, enable that theme and prepare to be amazed. Go back to the home page. Radiant. So that's a well-themed Drupal 8 site with a, um, yeah, nothing else to see there. So that's the video. Um, and just in summary, the benefits of an OCD deployment are uh, you get a deployment that's simple to execute, testable over and over and over again, repeatable, so you can do it many times, even going into production many times if needed, and reversible if it doesn't work. Because when you invest in building something big and important, no matter how tangible it is or virtual it is, when it's time to launch it, it feels really good when it goes right the first time. Thank you very much. It's a big boat. It's like, it's almost like a birthing process, right? <laughs> Not quite? <laughs> no, the sound's turned off. It really is, believe me. <laughs> Hello, everyone. All right, uh, thanks you for joining us. Uh, thanks Robert for the handoff. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, MailChimp, MailChimp and Drupal in particular. Uh, before I get started, I wanna introduce uh, Nate Ransom. He is the API liaison from MailChimp. Uh, I'm actually uh, Lev Zippin. I am with ThinkShout, I'm the CTO and founder. And so you may be wondering initially, why is ThinkShout here when we're talking about MailChimp? So uh, you know, what we're gonna be talking about is uh, ThinkShout's unique partnership with MailChimp in building and maintaining the Drupal MailChimp integration. So we're going to talk a little bit about the story uh, of that partnership and some of the successes we've had and our roadmap. And if there's interest in time, I'm happy to do a quick little demo of some of the new features that we've been working on. 
So first of all, I'm assuming that most people, if you guys are here, you probably know what MailChimp is. Uh, but you know, just in case you don't, um, from, from the chimp's mouth, uh, MailChimp sends more than 8 million uh, emails every day. Uh, you probably heard their adorable commercials uh, uh, from Serial where they say MailChimp. Um, <laughs> But they, they're a really, really fabulous email service provider. They make it really, really easy to send emails to lists of people, uh, really elegant tools for building your campaigns and managing your statistics. They've always had a really innovative feature set. And, and perhaps like most importantly from our perspective is they're really just great community citizens. They take amazing care of their customers and all of their partners like us. So you know, we work primarily in the nonprofit sector. And uh, you know, we just think that sector in particular is very, very well served by MailChimp. Not only do they take really good care of their clients, but that's a really great value too. You get like a ton of emails for free before you start paying. And after that, it's also really reasonable. Uh, so you know, here's a bit of a history of the MailChimp module. So this is MailChimp, the module. Uh, if you guys have questions about MailChimp, the service, I can kind of do my best to speak to them. But um, you know, Nate could probably chime in too if we have any questions about that. Oh, uh, one quick back step, though. Uh, another reason that uh, MailChimp is such a great partner to work with in terms of these integrations is their API. And uh, this kind of Nate's kind of bread and butter, but they've, um, you know, as, as far back as 2008 when I first started building out these tools, you know, they have far and away the best API to do these types of integrations. So even, you know, to this day, not to name names, but some of their leading competitors you know, still don't have near the type of tooling available to be able to build these seamless integrations, which we think are so important. But I won't name names. All right, so um, created the, the initial version of the module back in 2008. And, and at that point, I had my own kind of small company uh, doing a lot of contracting work. And, and I also had uh, what I like to call a case of shiny object syndrome. So I had all these like startup on the sides that didn't go anywhere or, or mean anything, but they were kind of fun. And one of them, was something called Mom Hub, and it was a social networking site for moms. I had a new child at the time. It was kind of a topic that was near and dear to my heart. And we needed to have email capability. It was kind of like a Google Groups type of clone, but focused on moms and play groups and stuff. So we wanted to, um, you know, uh, even back then I was working a lot with Drupal. I thought Drupal was a great platform to build the startup on, and I needed uh, robust email capability. So I went ahead and wrote a module that integrated uh, MailChimp with Drupal, and it basically allowed you to automatically subscribe people to listen to MailChimp so you could then send out emails automatically. Um, great, we kind of scratched my itch, uh, but believe it or not, MomHub didn't make it, um, and uh, I quickly shut that project down, but the module lived on, and, and it started to grow in popularity, and uh, you know, kind of right around the time when it had about 500 people using it, which you can see on the timeline here was around 2010, uh, you know, I was busy running and growing my own business, and I kept getting all these people asking me for support in the issue queues. And so I reached out to MailChimp, and I said, hey, I think there's a really great opportunity here. Um, what do you guys think about supporting the development and, 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 and ma maintaining this module and adding a bunch of great new features? And you know, to, their, to their credit, uh, again, even back then, it's forever ago in internet years, they, they saw the opportunity, and, and they started sponsoring the development of that module. And it's been a really great partnership ever since. Uh, so I don't need to read this off here, but yeah, we we um, we kind of been kind of basically keeping up with Drupal. Released the first version of Drupal uh, on Drupal 7. Uh, we did a complete rewrite, leveraging Drupal 7's entity system, so that we could do a lot more cool features. If you guys are familiar when Drupal 7 came out, that was the first time you could have custom entities in Drupal. So it wasn't enough that you could you know have your Drupal users be subscribed to MailChimp list. There were other types of data in Drupal that you also might want to synchronize with MailChimp. Um, you know, for example, we uh, wrote Red Hand, which is a native Drupal CRM, so there's a concept of contacts. We want those contacts to be synchronized with Drupal. Um, maybe uh, when somebody, you know, comments are also first class objects in Drupal. So maybe you know, when you leave a comment, you have the option to put in an email address. So you could automatically add people to the list whenever they leave a comment on your website. There's another, another common use case. So any type of Drupal object could get synced with MailChimp when we did that rewrite. Uh, so in 2012, uh, there, uh, another product came out um, called Mandrill. So Mandrill is also um, a product of MailChimp, and it is kind of a sibling uh, choice. So MailChimp is for email campaigns. So if you want to send like your typical newsletter you get in your inbox, um, yeah, that's something that you'd use MailChimp for. What Mandrill is is a transactional email service. 
So this is really more if you have an application that needs to send emails, you want to use a tool like Mandrill. Other options in the field are things like SendGrid. Uh, Amazon has a service called, um, I think it's S S T S, S S E S. thank you. Um, so Drupal, uh, even in Drupal 7, it has a really nice uh, abs abstraction to its mail system where you can use any tool you want to send email. It has to implement as the uh, mail system interface. So by default, Drupal sends emails using you know, PHP's native send mail functionality, which means that your web server is sending emails. So that kind of works fine in, until it doesn't, which is usually in a hurry if you have any type of a meaningful application that you're building. So the problems you have with just sending emails using like you know, your web server is you have problems with deliverability, lots of corporate firewalls and complex spam rules. Um, you know, nobody's going to know that what your web server is, is authorized to send email and it might be flagged as spam. Uh, it, it can be hard to craft really beautiful email templates that look good across all those many, many different mail clients. That's a, something else that Mandrill helps you with. And perhaps most importantly is it gives you accountability for those emails that were sent. So every email that goes out, you know who received it, when they opened it, if they clicked on any links. So we brought all of that functionality, including the activity tracking, into Drupal. So if you want to you know, have reliable email and send beautiful templates and do tracking and everything else, all you got to do is basically turn on that module, put in your API key, and all of a sudden your site will start using uh, Mandrill for sending emails. And another neat thing we did with that is um, there's, you know, your site sends all different kinds of emails, everything from you know, password resets to user, re user registration confirmations to order receipts, perhaps. So because you pay you know, per usage on that, you may not want to use Mandrill across the board for all the emails that you send. So you can actually go in and granularly select you know, which emails you want to use Mandrill for, and perhaps you know, your password resets, which maybe you don't care about so much, you can go ahead and use you know, the native functionality for that. Let's see. All right, so uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit. So finally, um, we're also excited to announce that just this week we released the first version of uh, MailChimp for Drupal 8. That's not up there on Drupal.org. It works great. Uh, we're really excited about that. And uh, if I have time here, I'll do a bit of a demo and show you guys how that works too. But that was a lot of fun. All right, so a little bit about our partnership. Um, Basically what we do is we, we get together with the MailChimp team, Nate and, and Christy, and we, we do kind of quarterly planning. So hey, what do we want to, what, what new features does MailChimp have coming down the pipe that we want to integrate into Drupal? You know, what are we hearing from the community in terms of what you guys want that we can add? So we kind of put together a project plan. Uh, we also do ongoing support. So basically every week we've got like a block of time that we spend you know, working in the issue queues, fixing bugs, uh, adding new features that people ask for, and just providing support. Uh, and of course, documentation is a big part of that as well. So it's great to have, be able to have that opportunity to not just build new features, but really support the community um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, you know, so we, you know, we, we, we're pretty uh, obviously biased because of uh, our great partnership with MailChimp, but we, you know, we really feel great recommending MailChimp to most of our clients because uh, not only is it a great service on its own, but you know, we know that it has such a great mature and stable Drupal integration, that it's a really solid choice. Uh, and, and MailChimp likewise promotes the integration through their channel. So they've got like an integration fund and they have like a website where they list all of their different um, you know, tools that they've integrated with so you can find it there as well. We promote the tool together at conferences. You know, we're really lucky to be sharing a booth with MailChimp. Um, here this week, we were uh, spent some time together at the big nonprofit technology conference a couple of months ago. So that's a really fun way for us to kind of promote our work together. And this is kind of my cheesy slide representing uh, a bit of a virtuous cycle. So, uh, you know, this is really a situation where it's kind of a unique win for everybody. I mean, MailChimp um, gets a bunch of new clients using uh, their service. They get really great, you know, uh, recognition for all the work they're doing supporting the community. The Drupal community gets a huge win because they've got a really well-maintained and strong integration with a great service. And you know, things show, you know, we get some work out of the project, but even much more importantly, it's just such a great story for us to be able to tell um, that it leads to a lot of goodwill on our part. All right, so what are the results? Uh, it's a little bit of a, a snapshot of the user statistics from Drupal.org. Since uh, the history here doesn't go back to 2008, but you know, we started working with them. There were about 500 people using the module. When I checked this week, there were 22,000. Um, so that's some pretty spectacular growth, and it's been linear and keeps going up. And I think that speaks a lot to the success of the partnership. 
All right, so real quick, I got a few features I'll talk about. Um, I ma I miss, I'm, eh, excuse me. I, uh, I mentioned earlier that you can automatically manage uh, the subscription to lists. So if you have people register on your site, they'll automatically get added to, for example, like a membership list uh, in MailChimp. When somebody creates an order through Drupal Commerce, they can auto automatically be added to lists. When users get deleted, they can be removed from lists. And you can do list segmentation based on the attributes of the entities that you're subscribing to the list. So uh, let's say you've got users and you've got like a taxonomy term describing you know, what part of the country uh, the users are in, or maybe you just use a zip code field. So you could create segmented MailChimp lists and send different targeted emails based on the attributes of your Drupal data, and that's all automated behind the scenes. Uh, when you look, um, uh, when you go to edit your profile, for example, you can uh, see whether or not you're subscribed to a newsletter. And when you edit your profile, you can go ahead and subscribe to newsletters. And I'll show you that in a minute. You can map any Drupal data to merge fields in MailChimp. So if you've got, you know, your first, last name, and email, and zip code uh, in Drupal, and you've got merge fields like that in your MailChimp list to do segmenting, that data gets automatically synchronized. And another use case, a bit different from that, is just creating forms for people to sign up for your newsletter. So this is more common. You go to a website. It's an anonymous visitor. You say, hey, sign up for our newsletter. So those forms get automatically created. They can be created in blocks or in pages. And all of the merge fields that you have set up in MailChimp will automatically get translated into Drupal form fields. Four minutes. Got it. Uh, I mentioned creating pages, blocks, or both. Uh, you can create MailChimp campaigns with your Drupal data. So this is a really great feature. So what we can do here is if you've got a bunch of content in your Drupal site and you want to send that out to your list subscribers, you actually go into the interface in Drupal, create the campaign, and automatically embed the Drupal content using a token system. It's basically an input filter. So you can put like you know, content, you, you put in some random text or images, and then embed your actual Drupal content, and there's an interface to do all of this, and then maybe add some more content and text, and then you actually go ahead and pick what list you want to send that to and click send, all from Drupal. So it can really streamline the managing of your newsletters and let the people who manage your content on your website also manage the content in your campaigns. You can go ahead and send those campaigns within Drupal and view the statistics on those campaigns. And I mentioned that. And you can build list segments using uh, views bulk operations, which can be really uh, handy as well. All right, the roadmap. We're going to release a stable 1.0 version on Drupal 8. Right now, the alpha 1 is out. MailChimp came out with a brand new API just in the last couple of months. So we're going to you know, re-architect uh, the module to use the new API and the new features it makes available. We're going to integrate with MailChimp Commerce 360, which is MailChimp's e-commerce tracking system. So maybe integrate that with Drupal Commerce. So when you have a shopping experience in Drupal Commerce, you can segment your users in MailChimp based on what they're doing. We're going to port Mandrill to Drupal 8 as well. And then we're also going to, you know, at that point, take a step back and reassess the module and feature set for, you know, what we call the Drupal 8 world. So much like what we did when we wrote the module for Dru Drupal 7, we didn't want to just do a straight port. We wanted to actually step back and see, hey, do the new features afforded to us in Drupal 8 create some opportunities that we can take advantage of and make an even better integration? Uh, funny quote here about monkeys from Henry James. Reminder about the sprints uh, tomorrow. Please go if you are going to be around. And if I have a minute or two, I can answer questions or do a quick demo. Let's see if this will work. All right, so this is a Drupal 8 site I got spun up. If I could make that menu disappear, that'd be great. Um, all right, we're going to go into web services configuration. Here we have MailChimp. So you can see here. We've got uh, global settings and campaigns. So I mentioned the campaign feature. I can go ahead in here and quickly add a campaign. I'm not supposed to do live demos. Somebody told me once. So let's see how this goes. All right. So here we are saying we're going to send this campaign to this list. We have the option to segment it. I'll skip that. The from email, the from name. Here is our MailChimp template. We'll just do something here called monster. And here are those content sections I mentioned. So um, here is the content, and we can inject our own um, 
page from the site. So here is some test content we have. We can use a teaser instead of the whole thing. We insert the token and that should basically work to create the campaign. Save as a draft. Darn it! So now we can preview it and save it actually all from this interface. So that's one quick feature. Here is the list I mentioned. So um, we have one list on MailChimp, which we've pulled into Drupal to make it available. And uh, real quick, here are the sign-up forms I mentioned. So if you take a look at this here, we've you can basically create uh, these sign-up forms as entities in Drupal, so you have a lot of flexibility in how you use them. Right here, I've just created something called newsletter sign-up. You can see here I can choose to make it available as a page and or a block. You can specify the URL, the label, the confirmation message. And down here, you specify which lists you want to show up in that subscription form. So it could be more than one list if you choose. And you can choose which merge fields within that list to display. And then you got a couple other um, nice affordances you can specify. So I do have that set up already. So if you look here on the uh, main menu of my site, I got a big newsletter button. When I click on that, I sign up for the newsletter as an anonymous user browsing the site. The other way you manage your, um, your subscriptions is So this, this is my user settings on this Drupal 8 site. If you see here, uh, I've got a newsletter subscription field. So that's actually a field type that the module provides. And if you look at the settings on this field type, this, this maps to a specific newsletter. And what this lets you do then, I'll skip ahead because I know we're almost out of time. So if I, go to my, if I go to my profile page down here, this is that newsletter field. So if I'm registering for the site or editing my profile, I can go ahead and subscribe to that newsletter just by clicking on that button. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you guys something. So this is my profile on Drupal.org. And if I go ahead and edit my so regular profile page, if I go ahead and edit this profile, you can see down, 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 down here, I've got an option to subscribe to a number of newsletters. Well, the exciting thing here is that Drupal.org is actually using the MailChimp module uh, as of a few months ago. So all of these newsletter subscriptions are actually managed um, you know, by MailChimp through the uh, Drupal module. And the neat thing is, is right, nobody knows when they're editing their profile that MailChimp is even involved in the mix. It's a completely seamless experience, and it's really nicely performant and, and works very well. Uh, the final piece of functionality, if we, if we have some time. Okay, I think I'm out of time, I'll call it there. All right, I'm getting the, uh, the token sign. All right, thank you. And I think we'll be at the, we have a booth downstairs, we'll be there probably uh, at least for a little bit longer. If you guys have any questions, wanna come by and say hi. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the uh, excellent info. Um, I've used MailChimp. I recently used it to um, have uh, newsletter signups uh, get the RSS feeds from our site. And I had no idea what I was doing, and it was very easy to do. <laughs> so it was very successful. Excellent. But I'm new to MailChimp, and I still have a lot of questions. I'm not really sure what it is. Is it a service? Is it a module? I guess it's both, right? From what I understood, it's, there's a MailChimp service. You get an account there, and then you use the module to do all the Drupal stuff that's with it. Um, but is it a paid service? Is it free software? Is it? There's I got a lot of questions. 
Sure. <laughs> is this? Yeah. All right. Uh, so MailChimp is a uh, platform. It's a uh, web service, uh, and it's a standalone thing. But ThinkShot has basically wrapped the majority of the MailChimp functionality into a single Drupal module. So uh, while they are kind of different, uh, ThinkShout has done a, an amazing job at kind of taking the essence of MailChimp and then making it easy for Drupal users to use MailChimp within Drupal. Okay, uh, so if I'm using this, the module that ThinkShout was lovely to make, I mean really, you've done a, done a excellent job so that someone who doesn't know what it is could use it. <laughs> but, you know, I'm Drupal friendly. Um, but um, is it, when I'm using that module, is this free software or am I going through a service and I'll have to pay for something that I don't know about? Or <laughs> Sure. So MailChimp offers a free plan. It's up to 2,000 subscribers uh, and 12,000 emails a month. And so as long as you're within that threshold, everything's completely free forever. Uh, we, do, we do have paid plans, uh, but unless you explicitly sign up, put in your credit card details, and like, sign up for one of those paid plans, you're free to use MailChimp for as long as you would like. Awesome. It's beautiful. And thank you for uh, getting together and making it even more beautiful. Thank you. Could I ask one more? Oh, just a quick one. The AWS back end, uh, this is for Robert, um, the OCD thing. Do you have to use Amazon to use the OCD deployment? So the home base for the, de the development um, environments that we have is always going to be AWS. Ah. But for deployment for the production site, as I mentioned, you can host your production site on AWS or on Google Cloud or on Azure or even on uh, a number of other public cloud providers around the world. So we have like Scandinavia or Scandinavian or Swiss specific clouds uh -huh. that we provision on. So you have a lot of geographical um, uh, choice about where your production site is hosted. Right, that it's all cloud things. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. doing it in your own infrastructure or own private cloud is not one of the options yet. Okay, I'll vote for that. Thank you. <laughs> First, uh, I, I wanted to know if um, you could help me differentiate the, the uh, two services, Mandrel and MailChimp. I have experience with MailChimp sending email mostly uh, you know, through the UI of MailChimp. I rarely use the uh, module in the UI. But what's the uh, different differentiator between MailChimp and Mandrel, and why would you make a choice to use one or the other or both at the same time? I may be misunderstanding. Uh, sure. So uh, MailChimp is typically uh, – email service for business, so you would have a list of contacts or people that you want to stay in touch with. They all get generally the same information. Uh, you can track those results, but people opt in and opt out, uh, yeah. whereas Mandrel is more of like a transactional, so uh, or action-based service. So if someone signs up to your website, okay. you want to send them some sort of confirmation email. You can do that with Mandrel. The password reset, that's also done with Mandrel. Um, so instead of using your own, you know, whatever technology you have on your server, you can use Mandrel, which is much more robust. Exactly. And then Mandrel also integrates with MailChimp, so then you can make, or you can uh, segment your list based on people who opened Mandrel emails or didn't open Mandrel emails okay. and that sort of thing. So there's that, that connection between those. Okay. Exactly. And then I had a, um, thank you, and I had another question about Taproom, unfortunately. I came in a little late. But is there any, any, any integration with uh, Afia's? environment to maybe use their uh, <laughs> repo and uh, perhaps pull down and create branches off of that. And uh, At the time, there's no direct platform Acquia connector that would move your site in between those two infrastructures. Mm -hmm. um, you're probably best served thinking them about them as competing services. I see. Um, but it's really easy to deploy a website onto platform. You push your code into the Git repository there, you move your da database into it, you move your files into it, and then you're ready to go. Okay, thank you. I'm just dealing with pain point right now when I have hundreds of sites and I'm in Acquia and I'm working for Mandrel and 
with the two gig requirement. I'd be happy to talk to you about that and how we could maybe move you away from multi-site, which I personally feel is um, more of a liability than uh, a boon. You can, my point of view with Drupal multi-site is that it was a way to share code base between multiple sites, but Git actually does the same thing. Yeah. And you, de you tie a bunch of sites together at the hip when they don't need to be um, using multi-site, whereas they'd be better served in most cases by putting them on individual site infrastructures, but doing your code management centrally uh, and deploying that using Git. Unfortunately, I'm the wrong guy to speak with about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will say to the um, further clarification of your first question, the concept of a transactional email is really important, especially for commerce. Um, you really want to make sure that your mail transport authority, whether it's Mandrill or uh, SES or um, SendGrid, is, has a, a great reputation because, for example, you want your product order confirmations and things like that and your invoices to reach their customers. Uh, it can be disastrous for e-commerce if you're not using a mail transport authority with a good reputation. And Platform.sh natively integrates with Mandrill for that very purpose because we need a very high reputation um, mail transport authority. And when we did our evaluation from the API standpoint, there is absolutely no question who the leader is in the crowd. Now, he didn't come here knowing I was going to be here and say that, but their API is hands down the best. So save yourself the trouble searching, just use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, what kind of uh, like advancements or what, what's forthcoming in uh, Salesforce integrations? Um, specifically, like I, I, it's been a while since we went through this. Previously, we were using Kazumi for MailChimp Salesforce integration. Uh, is there anything that, that is there like a Salesforce uh, integration with Drupal that could also talk to MailChimp or anything like that? Just for tracking donors and potential donors uh, for nonprofits. Well, I can speak to the Drupal integration. I'm not sure, Nate, if you got anything to add about uh, Salesforce directly talking to MailChimp. Mm. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk with you after the session. I don't want to. I'll, I'll let you. No, no, I think it's valuable. I mean, I, so we, we also maintain the Salesforce suite, the, the current version of it at least, and, and that offers a really robust bi-directional uh, bi integration between Drupal and Salesforce. Uh, so that includes any potential you know, MailChimp or Mandrill data, because those are all entities, and any entity in Drupal can be synced with any object in Salesforce. So the 3x branch of the Salesforce suite is really active and, and would work great. Um, but that doesn't speak directly to MailChimp um, integrating with Salesforce. Or, or yeah, so like the, the actual Salesforce MailChimp integration, like tracking in Salesforce when they're opening campaigns, things like that. Bef like the what we ran into with the problem with Kazumi was uh, we had a two-way push, and it was just flooding um, our Salesforce account with junk, basically. People right. who had no intention of ever donating, that kind of thing. And there's an API limit on Salesforce that you were probably running into, API calls. Yeah, uh, so we do have a, a kind of newer Salesforce integration called MailChimp for Salesforce. And it's just an app that you install within Salesforce. Um, right now, it doesn't do a whole lot of syncing as far as uh, member activity goes. But that is something that we have looked at, and we're trying to figure out a sane way to convey that data in Salesforce without blowing up your API limit. So um, if, if you have any feedback or any special requests that you would like to see, come find me, and I would love to get that information. Okay, sure. Real quick, I wanted to follow up on, on Robert's uh, point about Mandrill and activity tracking. I, I didn't get a chance to mention this uh, specifically, but one of the features of the Mandrill integration is that you can enable Mandrill activity tracking for any object in Drupal. So for example, Drupal users. So when you're looking at your user tab, uh, if you have the appropriate permissions, you get an additional local task there to view all of the email activity for that user. So if you are, for example, doing e-commerce on your site and you got a customer who gets in touch and said, hey, I never got my receipt, you can actually go to their profile and look to see every email they've been sent and whether or not they opened it. Um, so it can be a really useful feature for those types of projects. Um, so we use both Mandrill and MailChimp, and I have
have at previous companies as well, and I've never seen a really good solution for managing unsubscribes for people that unsubscribe from your MailChimp list to like not send them emails from Mandrill either. Um, I don't know if you guys have a <laughs> opinion on that, but uh, so that's kind of a, a s tricky one to answer, mainly because if someone unsubscribes from your email newsletters, they don't necessarily want to stop receiving password reset emails. Right. And so because there's that blurry line there, we don't automatically enforce that on the Mandrill side. Uh, MailChimp does offer webhooks to alert you when someone unsubscribes. Um, and depending on their unsubscribe reason or, or type, you could then take that information and then uh, essentially blacklist them from the Mandrill side of things as well. That's not something that we offer natively, so that would be something that you'd either have to roll your own or maybe there is someone out there that makes that process a little bit easier. Um, but like I said, it's, it's such a kind of murky area that we don't take an absolute stance on that. Right. Yeah, we do, we do something similar. We use the web hooks and we just like flag them as don't email them. And, and like as long as it's a password reset email, um, then we still email it to Mandrill. We have kind of a hybrid drip campaign versus transactional action based campaign that's kind of weird to describe, but. Um, <laughs> Gotcha. Like they don't want to keep those emails sometimes. So. Right. Um, but yeah, like like I said, it's kind of a, a weird thing. And each kind of Mandrill and Mailchimp user has their own specific setup. So for us, it, it's it's difficult to say absolutely never send this person email. So 